Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Think Big Bodybuilding Media. You're watching Muscle Minds with Dr. Scott Stevenson. I'm Scott McNally. Guys, if you haven't subscribed yet, do us a favor, hit the button. Uh, we have several podcasts coming out each week. Uh, Scott, I'm going to start this out today. I waited. I was going to take this a minute ago. Our sponsor, Azoth, uh, one mm -hmm. of the higher quality nootropic blends on the market. I know I'm going to need this. So I'm about to take this because we are about to talk about um, sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. And before we even get started, I need to know even what that means because I'm, <laughs> I'm confused. But wait a second. Okay. All right. All right. So there's a little passage. Yep. So let's, okay. Let's turn on the. Um, I'm ready. I've got my all the, all the backup brain cells. Yep. Yes. But let's let's wake up those resting those resting uh, sleeping neurons. Yes. And so I've got a nice. I cover this. It's, it's a few years old now, of course, but I cover this in my fortitude training book just like a topic that I just want to go into because um, it really kind of applies the way people sort of talk about this is that different types of training can evoke different types of hypertrophy. And there actually are some data suggesting that it's, it's, it is without a doubt, there's some logic and there's some ways that you can support that statement that really no one can argue against to some degree. So the idea is that in a muscle cell, the cytoplasm, the, what's inside the, the, the liquid, the fluid, everything in the cell is the cytoplasm, and you have all of the solid protein or other components in there. So if you've had biology, you've got all the organelles, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is the muscle's version of the endoplasmic reticulum. In the course of the muscle cell, you've got a lot of myofibrillar proteins. So it's actin and myosin and titan and desmin and blah, blah, blah. So... When muscle fibers grow, and this is a topic that I we can maybe go into next time when I when my like I said the prep time isn't robbed by technical difficulties. Yeah. Just having internet is first and foremost important for doing podcasts. Yeah, it helps. Um, yeah, usually you know, unless, unless you're just talking to yourself and hoping like maybe someone was listening in. Yeah, but well, um, live yeah, podcast you get, for your dogs. Pretty much. Well, they enjoy it. They, they you can imagine how smart they are. Like all the shit they know, they've heard me talk about. So. So you've got basically what has been sort of divvied up in, and this was originally, as far as I can tell, this was a notion put forth by Mel Siff in super training. Again, I talk about this in my quarter two training ebook. And the idea is that when the muscles grow, there are really, you can sort of divvy up the contribution to that increase in fiber volume or fiber cross-sectional area by looking at it from an increase in the myofibular proteins, the, the proteins that are involved with contractile, um, the contractile machinery, contractions producing force. And then there are the other components that are in the sarcoplasm, which means just means inside the cell. So Yeah, let's get that out of the way. Hold on, because that's... Just, what's yeah. the sarcoplasm, right? Yeah, Sarco yeah. Sarco means flesh. Okay. Sarcomere. When you hear sarco or myo, that refers to muscle most of the time. Okay. Sarco is just, it just means flesh. So plasm is, is like gelatinous fluid. The cytoplasm is the cell within the cell. Like if you had a, a cell and I'm trying to think like people, if you had like a, a the cells, like a regular cells, a round tennis ball and it's full of gel and you squeezed out everything that came out of that tennis ball, if you could squeeze it and pop it. It would be that would be called the cytoplasm and that would be fluid literally water and then all the protein components all the organelles that are involved with the cells function everything in there everything's really in the cytoplasm but if we take the myofibular proteins the contractile proteins that's the part that people think of as one it's and it's the large it's the majority of the cellular volume um, without a doubt but you've got everything else so if a cell had, a cell gets 50% larger, the standard notion and what is really what you see and the sort of the underlying assumption when people make measurements of muscle cell growth, but the problem is that those cellular, those increases in cell size don't really correlate all that well with increases in whole muscle size. It's really kind hmm. of a mixed bag and that's the complicated details that I would want to We'll address maybe on another podcast if people are interested. Okay. So you get all this extra contractile protein. That makes sense. The cell's getting bigger so it can get stronger as an adaptation to whatever stimulus has been presented to it. This is training is a, is a tensile stimulus, so you, more, you need more of the parts of the cell that are involved with producing tension. Those are the myofibular components. But the other pieces can get bigger too. So 
for instance, we know if, especially if you're to do higher reps and things that deplete glycogen yeah. a good bit, then you're going to have an increased glycogen synthesis. The, the cell's going to adapt by storing more glycogen. You just see this in general in trained individuals. They have more, they have higher levels of muscle glycogen than do those who don't. So, and glycogen also has an osmotic effect. So, glycogen is stored as it's just kind of two aspects of it. You can break it up into like a pro glycogen and a macro glycogen, and that's all coordinated in a very complicated process that involves a, a glycogenin protein. And when you're bringing all this stuff together and like literally setting up those fuel stores in the muscle cell, that is a solute in that cytoplasmic volume, and it pulls water to it, hmm. just like water follows salt, because you know that basic principle. You eat a bunch of salt, when you go to the Chinese buffet, you, you know, load in like 8,000 milligrams of sodium. Yes. That's your m main extracellular uh, electrolyte. And then the water is going to, as long as you drink a bunch, yeah, the water is going to be held on because that has an osmotic effect. Yeah. It whole, and the body regulates around sodium levels in the blood. So that's like the common, the people can probably relate to that getting, you know, go, eating a huge meal. And they go and they fall asleep in their recliner and then they wake up and they take their shoes off and they have cankles or they have huge sock rings yeah, or whatever. Yeah. That's water retention. That's an osmotic effect of the sodium and a failure of the body to regulate all that water and sodium loss because it's because that's a whole other story. But that's basically one of the things the body looks at is sodium concentrations. So when you store all this glycogen in the cell, you bring in water, too. And this is an interesting thing. I just was writing some things about this Um something that's coming out soon and probably anywhere from like three to four maybe even as much as five grams of water will come with each gram of stored glycogen oh wow so yeah so yeah exactly see so, i always thought it was rest, less i i thought there was like a, a bro rule that it was like two grams of water per one carbohydrate the bro rule is a lot of times three is it that i've heard okay the, but that's the bro rule it comes from yeah. 2.7 was a value that was determined in rat liver. Okay. Is when it comes to glycogen storage. And so that's where that comes from then is. Yeah, that's where that number, and it's just a rounding up. Yeah. People will say that. But here's the thing that people see when you load glycogen, when you do a carb up, some people will gain like 10 pounds. Yeah, yeah. 10, 15 pounds. And some people won't gain hardly anything at all. Yeah. So there's a various reasons for that some of it could just be how much water is pulled in to the intracellular component which probably is which 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 is variable this has been determined by some people in, in uh because ohio state bill sherman was the guy who did this years ago now and you really it's it's like it's something that no one's really ever tried to like dig into and figure out why mm. but even the amount of water that's stored per gram of glycogen it doesn't even correlate with how much glycogen gets stored. Okay. So it's not like the more glycogen you store, the less water that needs to come with it or something like that. Yeah. It's unrelated. Yeah. So it's kind of an unknown thing. And like one of the things too, this is one of the, one of the things that ideally people would, or in an ideal world, you might see when someone's really flat, but they're also watery. In the, let's say the morning of a show or like in the 12, 24 hours before Mary, it's like, Ah, you're flat, you're watery, you have too much water, let's not drink any water, let's take in carbs, so the carbs get stored in the skeletal muscle, because right. you're devoid of those there, you're sensitive, and hopefully the water then that comes along with the carbohydrate storage, the glycogen storage, is going to come from, it's going to come from the extracellular component, under the skin, not inside the muscle, it's going to come from under the skin, it'll go into the muscle, so you dry out and fill up simultaneously. Yeah. You pull the water from where you don't want it under the skin to where you do want it inside the muscle cell. So that right, that in and of itself is it's sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Yeah. So, and you would see that over time, like just if the cell, cell otherwise doesn't change whatsoever, let's say you only get more trained and the adaptation is to go from a certain, like, let's say 90, it's throw out the numbers, 90 millimoles per kilogram wet weight of glycogen store, glucosal units stored as glycogen, go from 90 to 140 or something like that. Pretty big difference. Yeah. So you get like a 50% increase in glycogen storage. 
and you translate that out over all the muscles of the body in a big person. If nothing else change, that could be that could be five, ten pounds hmm. in increase in muscle, literally in muscle wet weight. The muscles will get bigger. They've demonstrated that with ultrasound. And that's a, that's an a increase in muscle size due to a training effect that is evoked on glycogen storage. And it's not, in this case, in this hypothetical scenario, we're not talking about more myofibular protein. So it's not myofibular hypertrophy. It's hmm. not increase in cell size because of more myofibular contractile protein. It's because something in the sarcoplasmic component, in this case, glycogen, and the water that comes with it has made the cell bigger. Hmm, so that okay. will happen. Yeah. But the thing is, like, you'll get that. Like, you're, it's not like, you know, you go from, you know, you're, you, you go from, you know, eight months and you've got that increased glycogen storage, relatively speaking. And then, like, you know, like a few months later, a year later, you double that again. And then five years later, when you put on 50 pounds or 60 pounds, now you're storing like 10 times as much glycogen. That doesn't happen. That's a relatively acute change that essentially comes from being untrained to being trained, and it's not something that's going to like progressively increase hmm. as the muscle mass increases. Okay. So why that is that's that's really a relatively acute training adaptation. That's that's something that happens you know pretty rapidly, and you'll see the same thing too. And this is where we'll get to in this study that we just wanted to like talk about. Not to bash on the study; it's good that people are doing this, but it's the purpose is to sort of contextualize this information. Okay. The idea is that someone who's got many, many years of training could, this is where people use these terms, could do training that's focused on sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Okay. And like they could, like let's say they got 40 pounds of muscle and now they can get 10 more pounds through sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Okay. When they're five years into training. So here's where I'm connecting those. Hopefully you'll connect the dots. Here's what I'm trying to connect is that okay. those things that are happening that you would that you would say are the sarcoplasmic hypertrophy components, those those happen way out way at the beginning of your training. Okay. Okay. Those happen in the first, you know, a few months or year. Okay. It's not like all of a sudden, like, you know what, if I start doing high reps, I can get like a ton of mitochondrial biogenesis and I'll get all this sarcoplasmic growth, and that's where I can like take myself to the next level. I see. I see. So like highly, that's already happened. That, that if you, yes. When you start training, you're basically and so uh, you're going to start putting more of that fluid into the cell. There's only going to be like so much of that you can do. So it's not like if I were to do FST seven training now, five years mm -hmm. in that, like getting those extra pump sets in is going to somehow in increase those stores. And now my muscle will be holding even more volume of fluid permanently. Well, here's, here's the thing. And this is where our perceptions can be a little twisted. You're, you're dead on. FST7 was a great, great, great thing. So let's say someone is, they've never done any high rep, high volume training. Yeah. Not really. So they may have a small increment that they can get. Okay. Yeah. But they, they could get that at any time. Huh. Yeah. And let's, let's say like, you know, people carb up. They're depleted and they carb up and they fill out and the muscles grow. This has been there's a little bit of research demonstrating this. Guys see it all the time. That's why people carve up before shows. Yeah. That's that's technically hypertrophy. Yeah. But that comes and goes. Yeah, okay. Like those are those are like five pounds from being depleted to, you know, five pounds being up the other way being full. Those five pounds are like the, the variation in how whether you're glycogen depleted or glycogen super compensated that can happen. When you're a year into training, when you're 10 years into training, yeah, it's yeah. not new and novel growth. It's just something that is a sarcoplasmic hypertrophic component, but it's not not where it's not like you can say, well, you know what? I'm going to just like car deplete and carb load every week, you know, and use that as the way to grow. And then all of a sudden, like <laughs> in five years from now, I'm going to store more glycogen, you know, that no one ever has. Yeah, yeah. You can only store so much glycogen to get so much water. You can only get so much of an increase in those other components of the sarcoplasm. And those vary based on how you train. So there's some change there. Like someone who's never done F FST7 yeah. and they've never, de that will deplete glycogen. It's lots of volume, lots of reps. That'll drop glycogen down. 
And so they may end up being fuller, mm. and they'll see that. And plus, you're going to get swelling. Yeah, yeah. It's a whole other issue, like from inflammation. Right, right. Not, not even necessarily from an increase in the cell size, per se, from glycogen and water, the other things. That can obviously, you know, create an effect. Yeah. Because, you know, people will say, like, you know, gosh, I, you know, I trained and I look really good. If I don't, I've heard many times, if I don't train, like, every four or five days, I start to feel, like, kind of flattened out. Yeah, yeah. And that's about when my soreness kind of goes away, you know. It's like, so you train again. It's like, well, yeah, but some of that muscle fullness is, is from... The, the small amounts of inflammation that you get from the training bout. Right. So, so that, that is, that is probably, that's another sarcoplasmic hypertrophy hmm. component, but it comes and goes. Yeah. It's, it's not like, you know what? I want to make myself like really sore. So I have this <laughs> massive, like anaphylactic shock, like inflama inflammatory response. Yeah. That'll just make me just slow all the hell. And I'm gonna just I'm gonna focus on sarcoplasmic growth by creating inflammation. Okay. And like supra like beyond the world this world's possibilities levels of glycogen yeah. storage. So those are things that come and go and they will fluctuate and you'll see that. So that's the sarcoplasmic component. And it's a, it's a, people don't you will look in the literature, you'll see that noted on bodybuilding boards, you Googled it earlier. And people always talk about that. And Mel Siff introduced that idea. And it, it, it makes sense for the reason I just said, um, that you would see that, at least in acute studies. Okay. Especially if someone has gone from untrained to trained. Yeah. Where they're getting adaptations and everything. But it's the long haul muscle growth that bodybuilders are really looking for. And it, it could be that training in a way that reduces glycogen with a higher volume and then causes just chronically higher levels of glycogen and thus more sarcoplasmic volume uh -huh. is also the best way for those people to produce myofibular adaptations. So Which is the other hypertrophy. And that's the other the part of the cell, part. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like literally like 70% okay. of the cell volume or something like that. Okay. Muscles, mostly protein. Now let me ask you this. So, yeah. So if mm -hmm. you, if you, if you have, so if you're bringing like glycogen into the muscle cell and that's, that's in, that's in the sarcoplasmic uh, mm -hmm. hypertrophy that you're creating. Yeah. Is, is that glycogen then feeding the myofibular? It, like that's because that's always kind of like been my my bro logic that like if you take insulin, you eat a lot of carbs. Yeah, you're you know it's temporary, but you're pushing more nutrition into the muscle, and now it's gonna grow. So is there a relationship there that like is that sarcoplasmic uh, hypertrophy feeding into actually growing like real? Myo, yes. Okay. There, there is, there is an impact, and, and Brad Schoenfeld covered this in his is the paper. It's several years old now, like mechanisms of muscle hypertrophy. That everyone, it's a great read. You should definitely read that. He talks about um, uh, metabolic stress, tension, muscle damage, and then cell volumization. It's, I think those are kind of the big four that he talks about. And for instance, a couple of things there. So if if a cell is, and this has been shown in like liver cells, it hasn't been shown that I know of in muscle cells, but if you increase like cells that are in a culture disc, di dish, yeah. you, can, you can manipulate their volume. So make them larger and that will turn on anabolic processes. Oh. Kind of, kind of makes sense. It's sort of like, if you think about a house that needs to be appropriately decorated with plenty of furniture and pictures on the wall, et cetera, et cetera. And so your, your, your body and your cells are really, really keen to having the appropriate amount of interior design inside your cell. If all of a sudden, like you add like two rooms to your house, well, now you need to, you need to add furniture and the various other things in the house. The house is now bigger. The cell's now bigger. It needs to accommodate that by making sure that it maintains the normal interior design of the cell, I see. which means increasing those protein components. So insulin causes cell volumization and glycogen is part of that. You can actually prevent some of insulin's anabolic actions, at least in, in, in vitro, by like in a cell culture, by preventing the swelling. So the swelling seems to be connected to that anab anabolism that insulin brings on. Mm, okay. Um, and also if, there's, if you get a cell that's really glycogen depleted, that's associated with a more negative nitrogen balance in mm. the cell. 
okay. protein balance. So it, it makes sense if the cell literally doesn't have hardly any glycogen available to use, then that's that's picked up on. The cell's going to be smaller. We know that, so there could be a volume effect. I'd have to go and look at that literature to see if they controlled for cell volume in looking at the effect of glycogen in and of itself. Hmm. But without a doubt, like if the cell has no no glycogen around, you know that means energy re- reserves are scarce. It doesn't make sense. Now's the time to like you know turn on anabolism. It's like now's the time to like you know remodel my home and I have no money in my bank account. No, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. So there's something for that. That's why it's a good thing. Generally, I suggest that people stay as well hydrated as they can when they're dieting down. Okay. To keep to keep plenty of fluid around. Um, potassium is an important interest. In fact, one of the things you will in, you will prevent glycogen storage if there's no pota- if you are uh, replete, you don't have enough potassium. Hmm. So, literally, there's a study showing that is that like when they 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 made people potassium deficient temporarily, and they you don't store glycogen. No kidding. Wow. Completely blocks it. Yeah, it's a cool, kind of a cool study. Hmm. So that's a, something to make sure you have around, as well as sodium. Sodium is important for a glucose transport. The glucose transporters at the gut and in the skeletal muscle. Um, I don't know about the fructose transporter, but the glucose transporter for sure is sodium dependent. So when you take in carbs and they get digested mechanically and enzymatically in the the hydrochloric acid, everything, you break it down into glucose, and Mm -hmm. that's what gets from inside your gut, inside the lumen of your intestines, into your bloodstream, there's a transporter there. And the way it the way it works is it has to have a sodium as well as a glucose in order to to roll the turnstile and let you in from inside the gut to inside the, the body. Yeah, yeah. Same thing for glucose that's coming in that wants to be brought into the muscle cell through the GLUT4 transporter um, and the GLUT1 as well too. So, but those glucose transporters require sodium. So if you don't have any sodium around. Um, then you can run into problems. So people who are who are like their electrolytes are all screwy. They've been avoiding sodium to dry out, yeah. for instance, and they're trying to carb up when they've reduced their sodium levels because water follows salt. If you have less sodium, you'll have less water. It's like okay, now I'm good and dry. Now I'm going to carb up. It's like, uh oh, now you <laughs> there's can't. not enough sodium yeah. around. Now you, you know, now you potentially have. See this stuff. The bodybuilding stuff hasn't been directly uh, directly tested, but this is the physiological reason why this would be the case. Yeah, yeah. It's not enough sodium. You're not going to have good glucose transport. So people get, plus you're, especially if you're dehydrated, you're, you don't have, I mean, you're lacking in the fluids that are that are needed just for like basic basic processes. Yeah. So and like in the gut, and digestive processes. So you need sodium for the glucose transport, and you need potassium for the glycogen storage. Yeah. So this is one of the reasons, or these are several of the reasons why when I have, when I do a peak week, the way I've set it up is you first do your sort of depleting exercise, the insulin sensitivity exercise, just train at the beginning of the week, keep the carbs low, don't overdo it. It all depends on the person and their diet up to that point, how depleted they probably are. Then you carb up like Wednesday, Thursday for let's say a Saturday show Mm -hmm. when you got plenty of food, plenty of water. Load it all in. You don't lacking in sodium, not lacking in potassium. You've got everything there to load the muscle. It'll stay loaded for three to five days as long as you don't do anything to use up the glycogen. Mm, yeah, that's I've, been demonstrated too. I learned that from you, which I never really thought yeah. about. I figured like eventually that that glucose is just you know it's going to go somewhere. That glycogen, I mean, it, it's going it's going to go away. Yeah. But I guess it if you don't give it a reason to, it'll it'll hang yeah. around. You'll stay full longer. As long as you don't like, you know, just be a, like a posing, like a nervous posing idiot, or like try to pump up for two hours backstage, yeah, something like that. You know, sometimes people do that. They want to drop the water. They try yeah. to sweat it out. In the meantime, they they, they lose their their glycogen so they're hey what's going on guys scott mcnally here i'm going to jump in with a quick break and then we will get right back to the show by the way guys if you're listening to this on itunes do me a favor and leave us a five-star review 
All that stuff will help to uh, boost us up so that other people can find our programming. All right, guys, we're going to take just a brief pause to shout out truenutrition.com. I've been using them for years now, years long before they sponsored our programming, and so has Skip, and so has Scott Stevenson, and so has Dusty Hanshaw. In fact, those guys knew the owner, Dante Trudell, for years now, since back before he even had True Nutrition. He's the creator of DC Training, which we talk about all the time, and he's also the creator of True nutrition. He developed this company so that he could offer bodybuilders high quality supplements with no flashy marketing, no gimmicks, none of the stuff that would boost the pricing up. This way he could sell products for next to wholesale pricing and make sure that he kept them as high quality as possible. I back everything sold by truenutrition.com. You can get everything you need from all your protein powders to plant-based protein powders to whole food vitamins and fish oil to performance supplements like your NO products like citrus malate and beta alanine anything you could possibly think of you can get there at true nutrition and if you use our code advices that will let them know that you support our programming and in turn they'll continue to support what we are doing so once again that's truenutrition.com and our code advices supports our podcasts plus it'll get you a discount i also want to shout out getazoth.com that's a z o t h azoth is on the cutting edge of brain supplements increasing focus and attention, live in the zone, cognition and memory to process faster and think deeper, improves mood, controls stress, plus energy and motivation, start strong and finish stronger. Whatever you're investing your time in, the idea of nootropics is to get more out of it, to get more accomplished and to be more effective at what you're doing. I use nootropics to help boost my cognitive abilities while I'm podcasting, adjusting diets, and dialing people in on their contest preps. Azoth 2.0 is great for performance enhancement at my desk, but it's also great for performance enhancement in the gym. Check them out. You can go to getazoth.com. You can go to the Amazon link. Both of those are in our show notes. And we also have a code. Advices10 will get you 10% off at either of those sites. That's A-Z-O-T-H. Thank you guys for listening to our ads. Thank you for supporting us by shopping with our sponsors and using our codes. And if you have any questions, reach out to me at Scott McNally one on Instagram or hit me up at the advices radio group on Facebook. You know, they kind of were shooting themselves in the foot a little bit using that approach. So I guess that's a reason. So yes. Well, well, so what you're telling me, I feel like this kind of ties back to a lot of the stuff we've talked about with training and what's going to help you build the most amount of muscle possible that, Mm -hmm. Uh, psychoplasmic hypertrophy is going to happen. Sarco. Sarco. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I'm, I'm making a... you psycho with this fucking yeah, yeah. information. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm no Alex Kickle here. You got to forgive me. <laughs> um, so okay. you, uh, you, uh, you're going to kind of tap out on that early. You could, you could basically increase those stores early in your training, but once you get a year or two in, if you want to continue to grow, Chasing the pump is probably not going to be the answer. Is is what it sounds well, like to me. I mean, it, this, what I'm not what I'm not saying is that changing your training approach to create novelty of stimulus, which might be moving from a lower volume, more progressive overload, higher weights, lower reps type of strategy into something where you go where you periodize your training to you know let's call it chasing the pump. It's not that that could work really well. Okay. For someone who's never like done like you know high rep leg training because it's fucking brutal, they might get great mm. growth. Okay. We talked before. Keep people keep on referring to when I mentioned that anecdote of running the dude who showed me pictures of his of his legs. They had done the BFR training. And oh it was, yeah. Like, yeah. It's just they're just ridiculous. Yeah. That's that's like metabolic stress, low load, using up shitloads. You don't you're not going to use hardly any aerobic metabolism there because you're preventing a large amount of the blood flow. Yeah. You're not getting any oxygen, so you just can't. You know, you're literally you're you're, you're making it impossible to to rely upon aerobic metabolism because you've got no oxygen being delivered. Hmm. So you can grow from changing chasing the pump, and lots of people, lots of pros do that without a doubt. So what? But what I'm saying is that um, that sarcoplasmic you're going to be limited to some degree, and if you look over the long haul of someone's training you're going to see because the large part of the muscle is myofibular protein that's going to be increasing 
you know, the, to take someone from 180 to 250. And that's what I guess I'm saying is that, yeah. yeah. It, it, so in my opinion, then you can't just chase the pump in most cases. That like yeah. Remember when we talked to Brandon Curry and he was like, I realized that I can push myself hard and the harder mm-hmm. I push, the better I do and the better I grow. I feel like Brandon Curry could probably chase the pump and continue growing, you know? Yeah. But I don't know it's, if I can. Well, he, like, here's the thing. Like, let's take this to sort of its logical conclusion. Okay. If you think that, like, you could just, like, do only only training that is, and this is kind of what this study sort of pointed to, the one that we'll maybe get to if we do. Like, let, let's say you just, you know, all I want to do is just, like, increase the sarcoplasmic component. You know, and so you like the idea that you could put on, you know, let's say 50 pounds of muscle just by increasing the fluid volume in the cells, um, you know, increasing, you know, muscle size by twofold. Like th- there's nothing substantiating that idea. Okay. That would like, I mean, even just like probably, I would imagine most people who are cell biologists, like who knows, there are probably not very many listen to this, but biologists think, you know, could we just like take a cell that's so divinely organized to perform its functions and just lopsidedly increase one small component of it, like which is less than half the cell size, cell volume anyway, and double the cell size and just all the myofibrils just stay the same and all of a sudden like you've diluted them like twofold with all this glycogen like nothing suggests that you can increase glycogen levels to that extent or that you the cell wouldn't regulate its volume and prevent those kinds of increases yeah you don't get those relative increases in all the things that do contribute to a sarcoplasmic increase in cell size yeah but those are limited those the, the adaptation but what doesn't seem to be limited at least in this way the obviously there's limitations is that you can increase the cell size you can double cell size and see in in the, some of the studies have been done there that you don't see anything close to like a substantial dilution of the my, of the myofibril suggesting that like a large component of that sarco of that growth is because of the sarcoplasm hmm. it's mostly and largely the myofibrils but if you took someone from untrained to 2 years and they grew like a weed yeah you would see a sarcoplasmic component. They'd store, store more glycogen. You'd see that in an absolute sense, but it might contribute five or ten percent to to the f- whole fiber size. And it, that's that that five or ten percent would be something that you would have been able to see early on, more than likely, because you get immediate increases in glycogen stores, immediate increases in those enzymes. But they don't just progressively increase over the course of years in the way that contractile protein will mm, yeah so that's kind of the idea you can there are many ways to skin the cat as far as muscle growth but to think that you can just like target that sarcoplasmic and that's you know it certainly doesn't have the the potential for growth mm. that increase in the mitochondrial component or sorry the the myofibular component does okay so it would just like totally throw off the I mean, it'd be like, I don't know, like it, taking it like, I, you know, I always talk about my truck and working on my truck. It'd be like taking a, a truck, you know, that's gro- its gross vehicle weight rating is like 10,000 pounds, you know. And so now we're going to beef it up to a 20,000 pound truck. And you don't do like you don't switch out the suspension and the axles and like nothing. But all of a sudden, like, no, like that's not how Mother Nature works. That would just it'd create such a dysfunctional truck. You just that would be it. You'd just you'd. You'd split the axles. Yeah. You know, your truck would break down. You'd just overwhelm the frame of the vehicle. Yeah. Everything has to increase to some degree mm. in relative proportion. Okay. Um, but you can have some fluctuation in that sarcoplasmic component. So now probably um, we can pull up like that. Let's see. I sent you a, another text. The final figure? Yeah, the final one. I sent three. So don't show that third one yet. The middle okay. one, the second one. Okay, is that the one that has the the low three low sets. dip? Okay, the three sets. I got gotcha. you. Three sets: the pre mid post pre mid post pre mid. All right. So this was a, this is a study. That it, it's awesome that these guys are doing this work, and I only bring this up so people can people it gets mentioned. Like no one that I've seen who's talking about this um, has uh, has not mentioned this and is trying to like blow past it. But I think it's 
much more important than what's been emphasized in the past. So this was the original, this is a figure of total fiber cross-sectional area in the original study by Cody Hahn, awesome guy. He's, he's, uh, listen to him, actually, he's really well-spoken, brilliant muscle biologist, muscle physiologist. And um, they did a six-week training program, and they were comparing different um, su different ways of supplementing whey protein. So that's whey protein and graded whey protein. Those are the, the data there that why well, you have three groups there. So this is up on the screen, I take it right yep. now? Yep. People can see it. Okay, cool. So the main thing is that you can see, like, and interestingly enough, this was like a really high-volume training program. They're doing like... I think they started with like 20 sets per muscle group. This is the vastus lateralis, one of the quad muscles they sampled for this. Okay. And they worked up to like 32 or something like that. So definitely a high volume thing. Um, and actually there was kind of a dip. I don't think, statistically, it really doesn't matter for our purpose. But you can see that overall, you look at any of those three clusters from the three different groups. You know, they showed, you know, at least the first two. Showed kind of a dip in muscle fiber size a little bit. I don't know if it was significant. I don't see any, any indicating of that in the um, in the figure. And they came back and they just kind of got back to the kind of the break even point. Yeah. They're basically the fiber size got back to where they started yeah. over the six weeks. So and they didn't really see any any significant muscle growth, which you see here mm -hmm. in these figures. Like it just didn't happen. So, but of course, there's all as we talk about all the time. There's all this variability which, you know, is super important for coaches and for anyone listening. It's like, there's no average person. Like you're not the average person. You're the, you're an individual. Yeah. There's big air bars here. In some of these you can see. So first and foremost, before we move from here or second, um, but very important is look at the total fiber cross sectional area. So the, the vertical axis there, and you can see they're just around, this is just on average, um, for the different fiber types about 4,000 square microns that's pretty normal that's a normal value so they pretty much just kind of got back to where they were it wasn't wasn't a tremendous training system for putting on muscle size by any stretch mm -hmm. um, so especially because three weeks in they weren't doing so hot but they kind of recovered on average so now let's throw up the second or the first figure I sent you okay all right, I've got that one up. Oh, no, I don't. Now I've got that one up. So this was cool. I like that they did this. So they did a follow-up analysis, and what they did is they had sort of a breakpoint you can see there, and it's off to the right. You see there's a dotted box around those bar plots yeah. to the right side. Those are from individuals in the study. So each, each bar graph there it represents an individual. And they took the ones that actually experienced what they considered considerable fiber growth. Okay. So they got a little bit of growth out of the deal. So that's those were the responders. I think it was like 320 square microns. So and all the way up to it looks like maybe 1500 was the the best responder in their analysis. Hmm. Those are the ones they wrote a second paper on 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 sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Hmm. So and if you look at the rest of the individuals there that are on the left side of that plot, their bar graphs go down. Yeah. That means they lost fiber size. Really? At least based on the pre and post biopsies. They, they actually atrophied. Hmm. Or, or a couple of them showed, basically, there's sort of nothing. There's like five or six of them there, that five, maybe six, that you know pretty much stayed. But then, then there's several that, that showed what, if they use that 320 as the cutoff point, they showed, they showed noticeable loss of fiber size mm -hmm. and it's a simple it's a one biopsy like there's you know it's not a, there are some limitations to the measurement but um interesting enough you keep on looking to the left you go all the way to the far left and look at that big bar that dips down below the zero yeah there's that that poor sod who is at about like negative 2700 wow square microns that's I don't know. We don't know where he started. That's just the change. So he lost um, a lot. Week, week zero to week six. Yeah, he lost over 2,500 square microns. And I, we don't know where he was, where he started, but the average total size is like 4,000. Okay. And he lost over 2,500. Wow. 
Not good. No, God, no. Not, not a happy camper. No. Um, again, it's just one muscle, you know, one biopsy, you know, you get variation across those. So, but overall, I'm guessing that per- that person was definitely not a responder. You know, if if anything, I think we could probably say uh, he he would have been someone you might have categorized as having overtrained just yeah. in six weeks. Yeah. So, the main point of of what I'm kind of getting at is not to like pick on these guys because they did some really cool analyses, lots of cool stuff. Is they wanted to try to like you know dig into their data and figure out what's going on. It's interesting they had such a wide spread. They had yeah. people that grew and others that didn't grow. But overall, for someone who's listening, it's like, so what do I do? It's like, oh, people might think, well, you know, if I look at the training program that they used in this study, it was this high volume training program. Yeah. And this is the one where they documented sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Okay. Cool. I cannot, I've been growing for a while. I need to get some sarcoplasmic hypertrophy going. That's what I haven't been doing. Yeah. I'm going to start, I'm going to switch to this training program. Well, just take note before you dive in and take that approach that this training program on average did not cause muscle growth for your average person. Huh. For some people it did. For others it did not. And for others it was diabolically devastating to their muscle gain. Yeah, yeah. And one person at least. And there are a couple of people who were there it looked like they lost more than a thousand microns. So they had like a, that's probably about a 25%, just eyeballing it, 25% loss of fiber size. It's a lot. In those three people. Yeah, that's it's a, a lot. lot. And, they, and there were some people who had an increase in fiber size too. Yeah. You know, those are the ones they analyzed. So when they analyzed them, they found that there was an increase in those sarcoplasmic components. So they saw, um, Things like uh, increased a little bit of change, not so much in the fluid content, but they saw some of the sarcoplasmic proteins went up. Those are things like the enzymes okay. that we're talking about. Those are the enzymes of metabolism. Makes sense. This going from like doing very, I'm, I'm pretty sure these guys were untrained. I want to make sure so I'm not speaking out of my ass here. Um, but they were doing, I, I know they weren't doing 32 sets or whatever it is they ended up with. That's crazy. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a lot. So it makes sense that they would get a, um, let's see, da, 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 da. I'll pull up the original study here, make sure they were untrained. Okay. I'm pretty sure they were. I just want to be double check that shit. So it makes sense though, when you're doing that much volume that you're going to get, that's one of the ways that the body's going to adapt to these things is increase its enzymatic content hmm. so that you can increase the, um, energy supply Mm. because they're doing a lot of work yeah so where are the subjects doesn't maybe maybe this is why i can't remember because i'm not seeing there were they were were resistance trained okay so okay um yeah but doesn't say how much just resistance trained young men for local community oh with more than one year of resistance training so you know, they were squatting more than one and a half times their, their, their body weight. So these were trained people, so that's a good thing. Yeah. But I don't, I don't know that they documented and this um, what they were doing before, and they were doing a lot of work afterwards. Okay. So they got an enzymatic adaptation. Yeah. In these individuals yeah. that they analyzed, the ones who got some growth, and they also saw a dilution of the mitochondria, or sorry, the myofibular um, protein. Hmm. So... And then didn't see a change so much in the fluid content. So there, there was larger cells, and it was in these individuals that displayed the growth, it was due to an increase in the sarcoplasmic protein. Mm-hmm. They actually didn't see much by, the, by way of fluid and glycogen in mm. this particular study. There's a lot of information that will kind of leave be that probably people won't even remember or won't be able to make sense of. But the main thing that I wanted people to know from this is, yes, you can see sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. You can see what you'd expect, that you've diluted the my- myofibrils, which kind of, in a way, sort of kind of sucks, you know, because um, they got they got some growth, in some cases substantial. It was highly variable. Yeah. But you would expect that you also, you know, it would be great if they saw an increase in both. Sure. Right? I mean, if you dilute... And just looking at the numbers, if you're diluting the myo- the myosin protein content, which happened 
highly variable. Like you can you can find this act, myosin and actin were diluted, generally speaking, um, over time, and that was because you had all these other proteins that were diluting them. It makes you wonder. Well, one way to look at this, if you're negative, if you're not like you know, looking for the glass half full, is you could say, well, yeah, you got some growth, in in some people, and in those individuals, a lot of them found that you had they didn't get much in the way of myofibrillar growth yeah so that's you know that's okay but this this program with all that work damn that's a lot to do and not get some increase in the myofibrillar contractile protein yeah be nice right so th that is not uh this is not a program that's gonna work for everyone in fact it will work really poorly for some people hmm. you can get some sarcoplasmic reticulum growth this is in the this six weeks of a brand new novel program for these people, this is this is just this is one of those really high training volume. Mike Isertel was actually one of the authors on the first okay first, um, program. Yeah, so he was involved with this thing. Hmm. So that's kind of the deal, from what I understand at least. Okay, he was they consulted him. So that was that's my and Mike Mike. If I'm misspeaking, then let me know. Shoot me a shoot me a troll me or something. You know, <laughs> let me know what what I didn't say. So. That, I just wanted to make people know that when someone says, oh, sarcoplasma hypertrophy works, here's the data. It's like grain of salt with these data. Okay. And and everything else that I just said applies to. It's not something that you can you can target and make. like It's not like this untapped gold mine of potential muscle growth, mm. at least from what I'm seeing and what we know right now. Okay. Yeah. And now you can say sarcoplasmic hypertrophy in a sentence and sound cool. If you're yeah. listening at home. Yeah, everyone, Cody Hahn, the Hahn study, H-A-U-N, people talk about that. Yeah. Good dude, listen to, find, Google him, listen to, he's talked about this this study several times. He always makes note of this part. Yeah. I just want to, want people to know who are thinking like, because this, this, here's the thing, this this is what Brad Schoenfeld gets criticized for. This is what, and, and, and I'll say this is true here. It's not as if they were saying, and they're not at all, like I'm not trying to make a straw man out of this whatsoever. But people will do that. That's why I'm, mm. I'm framing it the way I am. Is people say like, well, you know, you got to do the Han training study. You want to do high volume if you want to get sarcoplasmic growth. Mm. They've never like said, well, this is a prescription for muscle size. Yeah. What they did is they documented like, so we have some people that don't grow and some people that do grow. Like what's going on with people that grow? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It actually fits the sarcoplasmic hypertrophy notion. Yeah, okay. It's We still can't like... Um, it's still not, it's not as if they designed the optimal program that is, does a really nice job of preventing any detraining and target specifically sarcoplasmic growth. I would love to know, maybe they did this and maybe it's on the way out. Like what the hell happened to those people who didn't gain size? Yeah. People on the left side of that last, that last plot. Yeah. What's going on with them in terms of myofibular protein? And mm. so did they, did they have did they have the same increases in enzymes and sarcoplasmic proteins right. that you might expect? And they're just like, they lost so much myofibular protein mm. or what happened to those people? One of the things they looked at fluid content, which would be indicative of residual inflammation. And the question is, so what, you know, that didn't seem to change. That's pretty much flatline. So that it doesn't suggest that these people were just highly inflamed. Um, they did do some DEXA measurements, hmm. and when they when they they found that extracellular water was higher at the end of training, or at least when they subtracted that out, they found a difference in the um, the DEXA derived lean muscle mass. So basically, mm -hmm. they were holding more water by the end of the the training program, mm. which you could think might be stress related. Okay. In these in these individuals. Okay. So. Um, that happened over like yeah they went from 10 sets per lift week one to 15 to 20 week three and then 24 28 and 32 that's a lot of sets that's, that's a lot of fucking sets that's a lot of sets. 10 reps yeah but they're like 10 reps to 60 percent of one rep max so they were not they weren't, weren't going to failure okay they're just doing the high volume lots of reps reserve type of thing so let's throw up now just for shits and grins because they did some cool follow-up okay let's throw up now that last um figure that I sent you. All right. Got that one up. All right. So this is, so now you're looking at these, these responders here that they analyzed and they, and that's the fiber cross sectional area. You can see like 
Um, you know, some of them, this is just for these guys. So this shows you their absolute numbers. This might be, we might be able to find, yeah, well, here, well, here's the interesting thing. Pretty much an increase as you would expect, because this is the ones they chose that showed an increase from pre to week six. Then they let them have a week off mm -hmm. and they looked at their fiber cross-sectional area afterwards. And I'll just kind of leave it at this. It, it goes down on average. I don't think that was significant. It went from about 4,400 to 4,100. So they lost a little bit there, just a week. Mm -hmm. But look at that bottom dude. I'm looking at him. He <laughs> he went way up. So this is pre and then week six and then a week off and then the, the week seven. That's one week off. And Ooh. He just rocketed Rebound, up. Baby. Rebound, no baby. No kidding. Yeah. He hung in there. He like he barely hung in there. Got a little bit of growth, so at least 32, 320 square microns. You know his line looks. There's the the dot right above his. Uh huh. Looks similar. Just about at the same. Yeah. There's there's three of them there that are kind of parallel with one another. Yeah. Yeah. So those are probably you know I'm not asking you to do this, but those are probably they're definitely on that left end um, of those who just barely made the cut to be considered responders and uh -huh. then be analyzed in the follow up. Yeah. And and so <laughs> so it's interesting. So what we see here is and this is this is why this individual data is so fascinating. And this is why, you know, coaches could, hey, like, pull this stuff up. If they show you this, this is gold, man. Like, this is why, from a certain sense, this is how someone who's been coaching for so many years can become so good because they recognize that there can be so many different responses yes. to given individuals. Yeah, yeah. So so look at, if you can, if people can maybe, like, you know, zoom in or hold their phones or, look, you know, pull up to their computer like I was there. Those three, those three lines at the bottom from pre to week six that are sort of in parallel. So it's mm -hmm. the guy. There's a cluster of one, two, three, four, five uh, uh, individuals there. They only they only do this like in a subset. I think of seven people. So this okay. isn't everybody. So we couldn't really tell who it is. But those there's three of them there that are in parallel. The bottom one, he goes from. It's gonna. I mean, it's like maybe thirty three hundred or something like that, or thirty thirty two hundred to maybe thirty five hundred. Mm -hmm. at week six and then he he's got the biggest fibers of anybody by the end he's the lowest at week six yeah of anyone he was second to lowest at pre barely grew and then he comes up and you know it's just one individual but mathematically speaking he's got the biggest fibers at week seven yeah he got he got he got more growth in one week <laughs> than any of them did in six yeah, when he rebounded. Yeah. And there was one that shit? and there's only one other guy who looks like he actually progressed. One other guy had a little bit of that. You know, and there's all there's measurement error, there's gonna be fluctuation. You know, you're gonna see um, they may even document this here, what their coefficient of variation is. Like if they do repeated samples and measure fiber size, yeah. You know, there's gonna be like some five, ten percent difference that you get. So a lot of those folks regressed. On average, they regressed. Yeah. Like, imagine if you pull that guy out. Oh, then the one that, the yeah. one that grew. Yeah. Then, then the, those numbers. Who knows? Like, that they just happened to. I think they. I'm not sure how they selected those seven. Maybe the seven just were willing to come in and get another biopsy taken. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. So that guy, that guy did what I have tried to set people up to do uh, with fortitude training. Ah. Uh, is to kind of auto regulate, get some growth, maybe a little bit more during the actual training period, but then have that kind of a rebound yeah so who knows what happened with him it could have been you know like um there was a uh, here's an example something that's just a personal thing so when i wrestled in eighth grade i weighed i wrestled in the 135s okay and then i went into ninth grade to wrestle and they wanted and i weighed like i came in weighing like 147 i was like having my growth spurt about that time and they said well you know, we want you to wrestle in like the 132s and there's like a 121 or one. I was trying to die. I kept, I was dieting down, like try to get to the, like the 121s or some shit like that. Okay. And literally like I, I'd wake up in the morning and I would have either a cup of, of cornflakes with a half a cup of skim milk or an orange. I go to school, I go to wrestling practice. I come home. I have a diet coke. I do my homework. I go to bed. Wow. I wouldn't eat. I was eating nothing else. Yeah. That was all I was eating. And so then, wrestling practice ended. Like I, you know, it was done. 
and I would come home from school and I would eat a box of cereal. Yeah, you would. <laughs> a whole fucking box. I probably grew like that motherfucker. Yeah. This guy <laughs> might, might have, like, he's like, holy shit, you know? Who knows what he did in that week? Yeah, yeah. You know, instead of, like, just dragging around, like, overtrained, like, zero appetite, like, not yeah. eating or whatever, like, all of a sudden now, and he's hitting the buffets instead of training, like, it's like I get a... I'm fucking sore as shit. Like, thank God this is over with. I think he started he gear. Through. That's my guess. He saw that he was the worst out of everybody, and he was like, I need this. That's what I... Well, I, I tell you what, like, he literally, he went from, like, 30, maybe, let's say it's 35, yeah. 33,000 square microns to almost uh, 5,500. Like, he increased, he went, let's say he went from 35,000 to 5,000, or 3,500 to 5,500. Yeah. Like that's like uh like all, he almost doubled his muscle size. Like yeah, that's, that's crazy. Seventy percent increase. That's Something crazy. Like that. Yeah, like like they, can you imagine like, um like he comes walking in, they're like, um, who are you? Yeah, like, yeah. You're like, where? Did you see George waiting outside? Like I am George. Like, did you eat George? I'm like what the fuck? Who right. are you? Like, right. You're so much fucking bigger. I wonder what his body weight did during that time, you know? Yeah. So a- anyway, this like this individuality stuff is awesome. The fact that just make note people look look at this as like this was not the best training program on average. Yeah. Some people like, you know, um they showed a little bit of D training, which some studies show you wouldn't you wouldn't expect this so much, but it's it's hard to say. It's a very small sample. I'm not gonna make too much of that, except that, that one individual is really, really interesting. Hmm. You know, how the hell did that happen? Like, what's going on there with that guy? And I wonder what happened, too, with these other individuals who lost size or just kind of stayed the same after six weeks. Mm, yeah. They got nothing. What happened after their week seven? Yeah. So it's like the, the cool stuff may have happened in, in large part or some of the very cool stuff after the training program was over hmm, yeah like let's see what happens you know uh, are some do some people do they have this guy had what would be called a functional overreaching right yeah right and he i could tell you i had in my own life that we, you, you take the quarantine i had to stop training and for a minute at the beginning of it i mm-hmm. i began growing i made some of my best progress into the quarantine and I became more selective with when I trained. I had a lot more time off, and mm-hmm. and I started making better progress because of that. Yeah, I'm sure of it. Lots of people. We talked about this. I think as the quarantine had just started, like yeah. I saw that with clients. Lots of people were doing that same thing. Yeah. So, and I I heard I heard Ben Chow mention like just yesterday on Foo Ads is like he had the same. He was training six days a week. Like more is better, more is better, and then yeah. he dropped it back to three or four. And a lot of people just do too much. Yeah, you don't you don't realize that until you have a forced layoff, or you push so hard like this that then you just stop, and you're like, holy shit! <laughs> like you're feeling kind of bad. Like I keep how do I, I keep on looking really like better every single day, and all I'm doing is resting. Right, you right. There's something to this idea that you don't grow in the gym, you grow outside the gym. Huh, maybe. So, so yeah, hopefully that helps people. It's not to pick on the study, but just sure. take it with a grain of salt. It's it's a phenomenon that. Uh, is does happen never, not doubting the data in one bit but it happens um, it's it's only a small slice of what probably most people most people would not who knows I would want to be interested to talk to those see how those folks were doing in the group that were analyzed okay the guy the person did the best they may have been like you know I can handle this or, or maybe they really sandbagged a lot yeah yeah so that they were able to like they got some growth stimulus out of it but it was they were like really leaving a lot of reps reserve maybe the guy who like who lost maybe that guy was just like made of iron mentally and just body just couldn't hang in there he just kept on doing what they said told him to do it's like i mean that's what would happen to me if i tried to do 32 sets <laughs> yeah yeah you know? yeah i mean i have to do something like it's you know the, the sets the, they weren't taking everything to failure but god right. it's right. crazy so there, it would be interesting to just have been the fly on the wall to watch, you know, how these people were training and what differentiated other than, you know, what we're seeing here. Right. Could you have predicted from some other aspect of their training whether they were going to grow or not? Yeah. We so, uh, we do have some questions if we uh, yeah. if you want to jump into those. Okay. Sure. So uh, we have three of them. 
first one is from Rob Taylor. He says, uh, hey, guys, highlight of the day. And he says, um, uh, how do you bring up one side versus the other? Uh, left rear delt versus right rear delt. Uh, left tricep versus right. Uh, not from poor training, but from surgery. So it sounds like he has maybe a discrepancy in one muscle. Yeah. I wish I knew what kind of surgery he had. Okay. Um, so maybe he had shoulder surgery. Hmm. Hard to say. Maybe okay. he had a triceps repair. That would make all the difference. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, because some people, most, we're all asymmetrical to some degree. Yeah. You know, we, we covered this question before, and I, I know I mentioned before, if you want to, like, trip yourself out, like, take a picture of yourself, like, head on and cut it into halves and then, like, make two, make a full body from two left halves, you know, flip one to the other way and then two right halves and then, like, compare those two people. Yeah. They're like, oh, those guys look like brothers. <laughs> they don't look like the same person, though. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you'll see your asymmetries. So there's a bunch of different ways to do this. Just get so big that people don't hardly notice it. Mm, yeah. Part of it, you know, like just grow and grow and grow. Um, you do obviously unilateral stuff where you're, where you're focusing on, you know, not letting the machine or the bar, if you're on a Smith machine balance out. So you're just naturally driving with one side. Chances are, if he has a surgery, he's had a surgery. This happens all the time with people who have like ACL repairs. They never get back. They do their rehab and they never get back to where they where they once were. They just let them out. Like they, they give them eight weeks of rehab. That's what their insurance pays for. And they never get their strength back mm -hmm. to where the good side was or where it was before before the surgery. So you, you're just continually accommodating. Um, you know, if it's if it's his non-dominant arm, he might not have used it much, and now he's not using it hardly at all. So there might be some just everyday use that's involved here. Yeah. If he's had a surgery and he can't do certain motions, then I, you know, I can't really, you'd have to work around those. Right. Um, one thing to do if he's like really concerned about it, if it's like just dramatic is in anything you're doing to target that specifically, just train the bad side first and it's just mm. matched with the good side. Yeah. You know, ideally you just let both of them grow and eventually things work their way out. But, he may have some activation deficit that's basically some people get nerve damage during surgeries. So that happens a lot. Mm, yeah. You know, neurons accidentally clip a nerve or what have you. And all of a sudden something's dead for a long while. Yeah. Um, so he may have pain. He may have limitations from the exercise. So there's so many things that surgery just doesn't, doesn't give me enough information to kind of target it, but you need to, here's a broader, here's a better answer maybe. So okay. figure out, figure out why it's smaller. So why would it be smaller? Is it just that it's still catching up? Hmm. Was the surgery just six weeks ago? Just give it some time. And, and then if it's, if it's smaller because you've got an, an activation, like it could be literally an anatomical issue, like a nerve was, was stretched or damaged or cut, what have you. Hmm. Well, that's, you know, you're, then you're going to have to just really work on that a good bit. Um, you could try, like, if you can find someone who does like the new fit, I talked to the guy here in town, his name's Chris, who has a new fit, um, e-stem device. Those are really it's kind of pricey to get that done, but that's something I think can, can help. I've got a, another friend who I helped use, he used a tens unit, mm, I'm not yeah. offering this as a service, just something I shared with a buddy. I know he didn't pay me for it, but, um, uh, you know, electrical stimulation can help with some of these things. So seeing a PT, if it's a neurological deficit, E-STEM will turn on those neurons in a way that you might not be able to. Mm, yeah. So you put like pads on, let's say it's a tricep, so you can't activate it properly. Mm -hmm. And you use E-STEM during act activity training. You activating the muscle, which is what you want. You get a training effect just from that, but it also sends signals back up the neurons all okay. the way to the spinal cord. Yeah. So you're stimulating the nerves too. You're getting the nerves to work. Yes. And nerves ad adapt as well. Yeah. So you can literally train the nerves because you, you may not be able to get a signal to go very well for whatever reason. Your your muscles and your nervous system are set up to work in conjunction with one another. Mm, yeah. So like an example of this that everyone's sort of seen, we'll, we'll pick on Jordan. We're always pumping up Jordan. We'll pick on Jordan here. Not really, but 
he has a, he shakes a lot when he trains. Okay. That's, this isn't really picking. You know, this is still pumping him up. But he shakes when he's doing his major efforts. And some of that is it's probably reflects Golgi tendon organ activation, which is inhibitory in nature. He's lifting such heavy loads that are putting so much stress on his tendons. And, the, and the, also there's joint proprioceptors that are trying to make sure everything's anatomically aligned, that that will tend to inhibit motor output to the muscles that are involved. Hmm. So a lot of tension in the tendon. You don't want to tear that tendon. Yeah. That Golgi tendon organ senses the tendon tension, feeds it back to the neuron involved with um, activating fibers of that muscle, or the neurons, and inhibits them. So he's driving the neural activation from his brain and his effort level. In the meantime, he's getting inhibition through that Golgi tendon organ. And those two things are battling one another. So some of those neurons are turning on and off and on and off, and they're not firing at an optimal firing rate. Okay. Because he's pushing so hard. Yeah. So if you're someone who's had like a, an injury that let's say now the joint doesn't align properly mm -hmm. or not as well as it could have, or there's pain, pain will cause inhibition in a big way. You, you know this, like, unless you can really psych yourself up, if something hurts, you just don't want to do it. You're, you'll just stop. Mm -hmm. You can't get yourself because it hurts too much. You sense that, obviously, but there's also pain receptors at the level of spinal cord that are feeding back to inhibit those neurons. Yeah. So if, a, if something hurts because it's improperly aligned or there's damage or residual unrepaired damage to a joint or something is not functioning optimally, for the anatomy and for that movement, then and that's a cause, that's because the neurons not not wired as well as it should be because it's been cut or what have you. Your nervous system will inhibit the motor output. Mm, yeah, and you just won't be able to activate it if you can't activate. It, you can't train it. It'll it'll stay a lagging muscle group. And that's where e stem can be nice because e stem doesn't give a rat's ass. It just activates the neuron, and it sends the signal both directions. So it turns on the neuron. And it can get those neurons to adapt and potentially remodel in a way that you never could hmm. because your, your, your body's constantly protecting itself yeah. in this hypothetical situation I've come up with. So East stem could work for him. Um, but you got to figure out what it is. You know, is it pain? Is the joints messed up? Is the nerve um, not working? So think anatomically. And it's also a matter of history. Was it surgery five weeks ago? Was it five years ago? Do you not like sometimes it's funny, like you can watch people. I've seen this, people do it clinically, and I do it when I've watched people too, is you like, let's say they got a, a lagging leg, you know, that they had a surgery on, it's five years post-surgery, and you watch how they get up, and like when they just get up from a chair, they get up with, like, with a staggered stance, mm -hmm. or they always get up with one leg, they're, not, they're, all, they're, all, they're favoring that leg, mm -hmm. still, right? and they're doing it probably all the time. Mm -hmm. And that will, that will this, there's just some minimal amount of daily activity that's needed for preventing atrophy. So they're, if they're doing it during those low load, simple situations, it's probably going on when they're training too. Yeah. That makes so, sense. Yeah. That makes sense. If he, if he's like, you know, if that was his dominant arm, let's say, and he used to comb his hair with that and now he's still doing it with the other hand. You know, the, well, you're you're not using, you're not doing things the way you once did. Mm -hmm. and what you can do as a as sort of a remedy for that is be very mindful and conscious of what your daily activities are. Don't cause yourself pain. Right. But if you've just got into this habit, this is like frozen. You know what a frozen shoulder is? Yes. Yeah. So that that's what happens. It's a really bad situation. Someone has some limited mobility in their shoulder for whatever reason. And then they just, they favor the shoulder they, and they stop using it. Eventually they lose, the shoulder becomes quote unquote frozen yeah. and it's useless to them. Yeah. Then they have a long road back because it's painful just maybe regardless of what caused them to stop using it so much, it can be painful just because they haven't used it. Like they've been just cradling, it's frozen like that. Just if they'd had a cast and they're in a cast for five, six weeks, that just, that shit just hurts just coming out of the cast. Even if there's nothing left that would make it painful otherwise right. it's the fact that it's been unused and disused right so that's a worst case scenario so he can have like he could have some you know very very mild and unnoticeable to him version of disuse in the terms of favoring that might be part of this too so yeah 
Hopefully that gives him something. I'm just tar- shotgunning. Yeah, yeah. Him. All right. Uh, got enough time for maybe one more here. Hey, guys. Right. Uh, I saw the other day a private medical company offering saliva testing for testosterone. How accurate do you, accurate do you think this method is, or is blood testing the best way to test hormones? I would still they, – they, you can use that. I would still use blood tests. You yeah. Know, you, can, you can do that. It's easy. Uh, maybe with COVID, you know, it'd be a way to do it. I, I'm not up to speed on the validity and the precision of that measure of those measurements. I've heard it's they're not a, as a good bit. Yeah, I've heard they're not as good. That's yeah, that's what I've heard. Yeah, so. it's it's not. It's yeah. I mean, you you hell, you got re- issues with blood 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 measurements too. Sure. You know, time of day, circadian rhythms, that kind of stuff. So now you're like one step beyond that with saliva, but um. If you're trying to measure something repeatedly and the, the convenience is really important, yeah. like let's say you want, I mean, if it's a cheap, relatively cheap test and you're trying to um, uh, like make biweekly measurements mm-hmm. and, you know, getting out and getting to a lab or what have you is, and this is, you know, it's more convenient, it's more economical, then yeah, you do that. Then you've got a measurement, but I wouldn't, for instance, try to compare saliva measurements um, I mean, different units, and it would try to like compare those necessarily with blood. I imagine they track well, but you got to make sure the conditions are exactly the same in both cases. So okay. just be very scientific in in gathering that. But you know, I can't tell. I, I wish you know I can look into that maybe for next time and see. Okay. Um, yeah, there's uh, been just, more and more of this. Um, I've seen companies actually. Company reached out to me, uh, wanting to advertise with us. Uh, and and I I said I wasn't interested just because I didn't know enough about it. But the stuff I had heard, and I believe Victoria is not a big fan of it from the research she's done. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is, you're going to get what you're getting is testosterone, and I'm I'm pretty sure this is not it's not it's reflective of the free testosterone levels. Okay, which would make it into saliva. I don't believe when it's when you have testosterone bound to albumin or sex hormone binding globulin. The purpose of that, especially the sex hormone binding globulin, is to keep it in the blood. Okay, yeah. And yeah. that's at least that's one thing it does, and people assume like the its purpose is to have kind of a reservoir. And it's the free testosterone that would go about, this is according to the free hi- hormone hypothesis, would do its do its number on the, on the muscle. There's also the megalin receptor, which we talked about, which binds serum, sex hormone binding globulin and testosterone together and brings those both in the cells. So there's, there's something there as well. So knowing total testosterone is important. Um, you know, someone could, people will sometimes be out of range on free, have low free, and their total is fine. Sure. So if your purposes are, for instance, to try to, like for, for sex drive and those sorts of things, depends on what this person is also doing as far as supplementation or super supplementation. He might, for instance, have great total testosterone. For whatever reason, he's got a lot of it's bound up. Yeah. His free testosterone is low. Yeah. And a lot of people take like proviron. It, it will it will displace testosterone by preferentially binding serum sex hormone binding globulin. Mm-hmm. Then you get more more free testosterone. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be something. So. If you knew that what your total was good and your free was what was only thing that was low, then you might say, okay, well, gosh, you know, go to a doctor. Maybe a doctor will prescribe you proviron. Problem solved. You're good to go because you're not hypogonadal based on the total. Yeah. Whereas if you just get the what's coming out in the saliva, you're like, oh, shit, I'm hypogonadal. I need to get on some exogenous testosterone. Mm-hmm. Because you don't know what the total is. You only know what's coming through the saliva. Right. And that may not be the most expedient and the most wise uh, solution, just hypothetically. Because that person, is got, they got good testosterone output. It's just a matter of free versus bound in terms of their mental health, sex drive, what have you. That may be a much easier fix for yeah. them. Yeah. For instance, not that they're saying they should or shouldn't do that. But instead, like, they, well, I'll just use exogenous testosterone. And now they make themselves, this is one of the, down, the downfalls of TRT, is once you start that, then you're relying upon that. You're suppressing the hormonal axis. Yeah. Your endogenous levels are shut down. And now he's, he's, he's presenting an insult to his endogenous testosterone production. 
by using the exogenous. And now he's got that, you know, if he wants to travel or what have you, he's got to deal with all those sorts of issues. Mm -hmm. Whereas the solution could have been much simpler mm -hmm. for him and figure out like what's, what else is going on with his, with his bound versus his total. So one more note from George White. He says, follow up on the four months of bands uh, only situation. He says, two yeah. weeks later, reps and poundages are back to maximum. Being old as dirt has his advantages, fellas. Never miss. <laughs> he said, never miss the show. Thanks, George. Yeah, right on. Yeah, thanks, brother. Yeah. He's a great guy, man. I love that dude. All right. Well, with all that said, guys, head over to uh, byobbcoach.com. You can check out Scott's book over there. Go to fortitudetraining.net. We talked a little bit about the Fortitude Training ebook today. Of course, check out our sponsors, truenutrition.com, use our code advices. And uh, as off, I was able to stay plugged in today, Scott, because I took oh. my as off. So there's great. a little dip there when I was rambling on about all sorts of shit. But yeah, you but, we got it back to speed. But the uh, the putting on track. The as off helped me to to pull it back in. So uh, yeah, guys, you can right. check them out. We've got links to that stuff in all of our descriptions. Of course, once again, if you haven't subscribed yet. Do us a favor, hit the button, uh, hit the bell so you can stay up to date with everything we have coming out. If you enjoy this show, do us a favor, hit the like button so you can help uh, spread this stuff through the algorithms. Guys, for another episode of Muscle Minds with Dr. Scott, I'm Scott McNally. We'll see you soon, guys. Thanks, 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 guys.